Okay, welcome to 6B. Can you hear us at the back? Right, great. So a lot of this morning's discussion was about is no net loss going to work? Uh, is it right? Can biodiversity offsets work? This session is about pragma pragmatic implementation on the ground. So the assumption, the departure point for this, for this session is that no net loss and biodiversity offsets, the horse has bolted. The ship has already left the port. Uh, there are bank policies, there are government policies, there are corporate policies, there are papers out there describing this. The requirements for no net loss are already there on the ground. And here we have a set of practitioners who are coming up with the pragmatic solutions to dealing with no net loss through the mitigation hierarchy. So the assumptions here are that no net loss or net gain is an organizing framework. It engages stakeholders. It promotes quantification. Um, and it promotes a close look at the residual impact, something Susie Brownlee was uh, commenting on this morning. And also that no net loss, net gain is, if you like, like a standard bearing paradigm. It's this new paradigm around which we are all coalescing, including governments, civil society, and, uh, and companies. Um, and it's driving enormous investments of, in innovation on the ground. And we're going to hear about some of that innovation today. It's 4 p.m. in the afternoon. Everyone wants a beer, so we're going to try to avoid death by presentation. Uh, so in fact, the, the panel are going to make short presentations, very short, say uh, three, four minutes each, on uh, uh, their project in particular. And then we're going to be running it as a, as a thematic uh, question and answer, where I ask several questions to the panel, and then we'll open up uh, to, the, uh, to the floor for one question for each of these uh, thematic questions. And the kinds of things we're going to answer are, uh, how is the project addressing mitigation? How are you dealing with the landscape concept, uh, context? How are you dealing with stakeholders' additionality? Some of these uh, recurring but problematic issues that are very case and context specific. So uh, we are going to start with Helen. Uh, apparently, it's difficult to hear. At the, can you hear me at the back? Great. Apparently, it's difficult to hear at the back, so it's suggested that you come forward. Okay. Unless you think you have a voice like a megaphone. Yeah, can anybody? Can everybody hear me at the back? All right. <laughs> okay, let's give it a go. All right. Um, let me, oh, the Come slides on. there anyway. So. Uh, sorry, could we have people on the podium if possible? Just put a microphone there. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Helen Bailey. I'm a senior program manager at Fauna and Flora International. I'm here representing the, the team who are all working on this project. We've got Pippa Harrod in the audience here and also uh, Joanna from uh, Anglo-American from the exploration team here as well today. Um, so the project that we've been working on is called Sakati. It's a copper, nickel and platinum group exploration project managed by Anglo-American in Finland. Um, the exploration concession area actually intersects with the Natura 2000 site called Vienkiapa, which you can see as this red spot up there. Um, and uh, it's been designated for the 79 different habitat types found there, different bog and mire habitat types found there, most of which are uh, rare or endangered now, primarily due to the land conversion in Finland for forestry. The motivation to achieve no net loss, the commitment made by Anglo-American, is uh, due to the sensitivity of the site. It's due to the controversial nature of um, exploring within this area. And it's also due to the highly regulated nature of the Finnish legal system. Uh, but not only that, I think Anglo-American has identified an opportunity to demonstrate leadership in this area. It's a fairly, well, it's a, it's a case in pre of precedence. Um, it's not been done before, so they, they want to demonstrate le leadership by planning for early integration of mitigation options and uh, trying to be as transparent as possible throughout the whole process. The standards and methodologies that we're using in this project, um, we're going to be applying international best practice, so following international um, the IFC performance standard 6 to inform our no net loss um, aims and objectives. And when, when it comes to the identification of offset sites, uh, we're also going to be using equivalence metrics that have been used internationally, and then trying to um, adjust those for the local context as well with local partners. We're also going to be using some statistical analysis um, and GIS modeling to find the ecological equivalencies uh, in the landscape as well. 
So those are, that's a brief introduction to the project and I hope to answer some more questions and give you a bit more information about that project as we go on. Great, thanks Helen. Thank you. I'm Anders, uh, I'm the CEO of an ecology consultancy in Sweden. We are dealing with a handful of big biodiversity offsetting projects, uh, four of them, of them in mining and one that I will present now that is connected to railway. And this is actually a project that today is delivering biodiversity. So I think it's uh, a little bit unusual in this concept because a lot of projects are in planning stage. But this has been delivering biodiversity since 2011. Uh, this is a, a, an area located 600 kilometers north of Stockholm along the Baltic coast uh, in a river delta that was affected by the plans of a new uh, coastal railway, 190 kilometers railway along the coastline, uh, planned and built by the National Railway Administration, started operating in 2011. Uh, and this river delta has shallow waters and adjacent, adjacent arable lands, uh, together offering one of northern Scandinavia's largest and most suitable areas for spring migrating wetland birds. There is also a big proportion of deciduous forests in this area uh, uh, due to uh, land upheaval, primary deciduous forests. And uh, uh, the, the drivers in this, in this project was protection due to Natura 2000, uh, the Habitat Directive, uh, with protected habitats and protected species. Uh, the protection of the area was expanded during the uh, permission process, uh, subst substantially expanding. And uh, as you see on the area on the map, uh, the, the gray areas are the protected area of about 3,000 hectares of arable land, forests, wetlands, and open shallow waters in the river delta. The railway was planned through a sort of a bottleneck in the area, the, re the red line on the, on the map. The, the green and the red areas are the offsetting areas, uh, altogether 500 hectares. So it was a landscape context of the, the uh, how to say, the scoping of possible, possible um, uh, biodiverse uh, offsetting areas. Uh, the drivers was the habitat directive, as I, I said, and there was, it was a very long process of permission involving, involving the DG environment, the Swedish government, and four uh, long permission processing in the Swedish environmental courts. Uh, so I think I will get questions about the standards later, how it, how it uh, uh, the design, but uh, I will say that the planning took place during a from 2001 to 2007, uh, the building of the, the railway and the, the building of the compensatory measures during the years 2008 to 2010. Since then, the, the railway is working and the, the offsetting areas are working. Uh, and there is a long-term monitoring of consequences and fulfillment of the compensatory measures in the area. And there is also long-term management for the compensation. I think I stopped there. Uh, sorry, just change slide. Uh, th this is a picture of the railway in the middle of the, uh, the picture and the parts of the compensation area, which is new wetlands, new uh, shallow, uh, how to say, temporarily sh um, flooded waters on ar arable lands during April month only. And otherwise used for, for growing crops. And this is about a fifth of the compensation area. So it's much bigger than this. Could you just tell us briefly, what is the footprint of the impact itself, and what's the footprint of the area put under conservation management in, in hectares? Uh, the footprint of, of, of the, the, the... What's the, the size of the impact in hectares? The, the impact in hectares is, the direct foot footprint is only about 20 to 40 hectares, how you measure. But then there's indirect uh, consequences due to 
disturbance on, on these wetland areas that, that were along, along the railway. Uh, and the compensatory scheme was about 500 hectares, half of it for the birds and half of it for the deciduous forest habitats. There's two aims with the project, birds and deciduous forest habitats. Great. Thanks very much. We'll go into some more details on that during the question. Thank you. So the aim of these short presentations is to give you an idea of the project itself, the main drivers for why mitigation has been undertaken, and uh, lastly some of the methods um, uh, that have been used to uh, implement the mitigation hierarchy and or the biodiversity offset. We now have uh, Valérie David um, from Etage, who is going to make us a presentation on uh, uh, a railway which has been developed in Brittany. Hello everybody, I'm sorry for my English, which is terribly bad, so I hope you will understand me. Um, I'm a Director for Sustainable Development in the company, the name is Effage. Effage is the third French company, a global player in uh, public works and building and energy. Um, the project I uh, would like to, to evoke is a high-speed railway between uh, Le Mans and Rennes. Uh, 182 kilometers, uh, which is the largest project in the group's history. Uh, the global coast reach uh, 3 billion euro. Um, this project is very important for us because there will be a before and an after uh, the high speed railway of uh, Bretagne Bédois. Uh, first of all, the first point I would like to develop is the new governance that we created. Uh, we created a cross-disciplinary committee on sustainability, bringing together operational managers, including, of course, uh, the environmental dimensions. The first time I told uh, the, the managing director of this project that he will lead the committee on sustainability, I can tell you that I had a couple of minutes of loneliness. <laughs> really, uh, he's one of the uh, most famous, maybe, uh, experts uh, for civil engineering in France. He built the Viaduct of Millau, maybe you know this highest bridge in the world, the Viaduct of Millau. So Marc Legrand is the creator and the, the, the leading manager of the uh, Viaduct of Millau, and he is the president of the Committee on Sustainability. And I can tell you that this is a key of success uh, because really from the beginning we had the opportunity to apply the avoid, reduce, offset approach. Uh, the second point I would like to underline is, um, uh, as you can see, uh, how we uh, manage uh, to, to, to get a very intensive ecological benefit. Uh, when you, you see uh, that this line is everything but not straight. <laughs> it's a very wavy line and this uh, track, this path, avoids major woodland and areas corresponding of high biodiversity. We, had, we were lucky because part of the work had been done before us. <laughs> uh, no natural uh, 2,000 areas were impacted and only three areas of interest for ecology, fauna and flora were initially impacted and we managed to reduce the impact by a third. So, uh, in France, maybe you know, <laughs> three regulations govern ecological compensation. First of all, the Forestry Act for land clearing and afforestation, the Water Act for impacts on streams, groundwater and aquatic environments, and then the prohibition, the Biodiversity Act, the prohibition uh, of movement or destruction of protected species. And we tried with that project, it was the first time for us, we tried to address the three laws within the same perimeter. Uh, I mean that the same compensation can address different impacts. It's the principle of fungibility, and the rate of fungibility on this project is about 25% between woodlands, between um, water components, and protected species, notably bats and amphibians. Uh, this is what we refer to as an intensive ecological benefit, and the aim is, of course, intensive compensation rather than excessive land consumption. It 
was very important because Brittany, as you know, is a fatherland, and we needed to um, uh, to pacify uh, the um, the situation with farmers who think that um, the building of uh, linear infrastructures mean a double punishment because we take grounds for the building of the infrastructures and we take grounds for the offset measures. Um, the last point I would like to develop, but there will be, of, um, there will be uh, uh, questions, is, um, excuse me, yes, how to explore new offset avenues. So apart from ecological regulations, we wanted to experiment other ways to improve biodiversity in territories alongside the line. Uh, we wanted to anticipate uh, the evolution of regulation because we thought that the regulation could shift from an, an approach based on protected species and environments to the restoration of ecosystem services. So in this context, we created a new, a new fun um, financial mechanism with, um, with a regional environmental engineering company, Derven, and we implemented a partnership with the NGO Green Cross Fronts and Territories. So this uh, financial uh, mechanism finances the entire chain of actions needed to restore the ecological services for natural water conservation and to maintain the space in a water-friendly manner. So firstly, we pay for the agri-ecological analysis of territories. Then we pay for the ecological engineering operations necessary to improve their functionality. And finally, for the ecological monitoring and evaluation. All this process is assumed on a voluntary basis. This is totally new. We, we, we got an award from the ministry for this project, but they didn't help us at all because the <laughs> implementation of FIPEN faced a lot of difficulties because it's based on uh, this um, new concept, sometimes misunderstood, of payment for the maintenance of ecological services. And it required a two-year effort to, put, to be put into place. I hope there will be some questions of it. Thank you, Valerie. <laughs> now moving on to Sandra uh, Berma, who is uh, going to give us a presentation of the project in the United States. Good afternoon, everybody. So I will be talking um, about project from Suez Environnement. I'm personally working for the French water subsidiary of Suez Environnement, and I'm going to talk about a project from some of my colleagues based in the US, in New Jersey, who are setting up a mitigation bank. The project was actually triggered by the need for compensation by the Teterboro Airport, which is nearby for, from land owned by United Water. And I would like to underline that this is quite uncommon for water companies, whether in the US or <coughs> elsewhere, including France, um, to own land. So here it was really an opportunity that was used to, from that land, which was not used, to make better something and to restore biodiversity on that land. Um, in fact, what we now know, and it was decided a few weeks ago, is that the Tetraboro Airport will not be able to use the restoration area that we have, but still, the decision was made to still imp implement the mitigation bank, and a few weeks ago, well, or one week ago, I think, um, there was the signature from the Environmental Protection Agency to approve the mitigation bank, and the credits will be provided in some time. So basically we're talking about um, an area which is close to a, a water reservoir for, the, for, the, the New, Jer for New Jersey. Um, it's about 44 acres, which is something around 20 hectares or a little bit, little bit less. Um, and basically the restoration work that, is, um, that has to be done is hydrologic enhancement, um, removal of exotic vegetation, invasive veget vegetation, the prevention of deer overbrowsing through fencing, 
um, planting a number of natural vegetation um, and the restoration of systemic structure and function um, so that this area is functional and, and, and um, relates to the surrounding areas. I think that's it for the Great. first presentation. And Thank you, Sandra. Now we have uh, Claire uh, Wongsbury from Atkins, who is going to give us a presentation on the widening of the A21 in Tunbridge in the UK. Thank you. I'm the ecologist and an associate director at Atkins. The A21 widening scheme is about three kilometres of road. It's a scheme that's got planning permission but it hasn't yet been built, so that's the stage we're at. The road widening was proposed for safety reasons, and it's in a very constrained location, because on both sides of the road, right up to the edge of the road, there's ancient woodland. So this is one of the habitats that's recognised through all the discussion whether we have biodiversity offsetting as a system in England or not. This is one of the irreplaceable habitats where you can't use some numbers and say, if we do that, we wipe out that impact, it's all fine. In this scheme, the mitigation hierarchy was used very, very firmly. So when the engineers sat down with their first design brief, the bullet points included one saying, minimise loss of ancient woodland. It's a scheme where if you went offline and created a new road, you would lose more ancient woodland and you'd create a new barrier within the woodland. And in the widening online, the engineers worked very, very closely with the ecologists and others to tweak wherever they could to keep the loss to an absolute minimum. And this is in a context where ecology isn't the only issue. Because in the north, there's a pinch point where they had listed buildings of heritage value on one side of the road, directly opposite to a scheduled ancient monument. So they had a lot to work around. The impact was minimised and compensation was provided. There were also protected species of another key issue, particularly bats and dormice. So for them, again, compensation was provided. Have the next slide. In the woodland creation, two of the key things that maximised the benefit of what would be created were location. So the new woodlands were put close to areas of impact, adjacent to existing ancient woodland so wildlife could move into it, and also where they had added value, joining areas of woodland or between existing areas of woodland, filling in gaps between them and the road, so providing buffering. Another thing that's planned to be used is translocation. Now this is not at all suggesting that you can pick up an ancient woodland, ship it off on the back of a lorry, put it down and it's still ancient woodland. It's not pretending it's that, it's a salvage exercise. So taking up some coppice stools, taking the soil where possible, taking dead wood and material so that the new wood that created, that's created, some of it has some of those features retained from the woodland that's going to be lost. So it's not ancient woodland anymore, but it's better woodland than it would have been without those additions. So this isn't a scheme where I or anyone could say it's fine, no net loss there's a loss of nine hectares of ancient woodland in this case. The policy decision was that the benefits of the scheme, forgetting the compensation, because that's not a benefit, that's just part of the mitigation package, the benefits of the scheme were decided, yes, that outweighs that loss. But still, a good compensation will be provided when this scheme is built. Thank you.
Thanks very much, Claire, and a very interesting example of where uh, you can uh, mitigate to a certain degree, but then there may be some impacts which are unavoidable. It may not be possible to achieve no net loss for those uh, impacts, and therefore a compensation uh, attempt to be made, which isn't necessarily no net loss. Now we have... Uh, can Sure, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. I don't know if, um, if, if this announcement was made in this session, but we're live streaming this room, uh, and we've got mics that are picking up the, uh, the speakers, uh, the panels. We've got a, a, it's called a shotgun mic up here. It's not picking up anyone here when we get to questions, so if there are questions from the floor, John, could you capture them and just repeat them for the audience? Okay, thank you. Thanks. We'll do. Thank you, Patrick. Yeah. Great. So now we're going on to uh, Stina Eriksson from LKAB, who is going to describe some of the issues involved in designing the compensation for an open pit iron ore mine in northern Sweden. <laughs> yeah, so that's my first slide. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm Stina Eriksson, I, and I work at a company called LKAB, which is an iron ore mine, mine company. So this is actually the both the compensation um, the grounds for compensation and also the affected area. Um, this area here is where we plan to put the mine. Uh, you can see the different colors. So that's because we've chosen to um, not only um, compensate for direct uh, direct um, effects, but also for in the indirect effects. So the uh, dark gray or the light gray areas are where we will have our open pit and also where we will put our waste rock and the um, light green and the yellows are uh, high and low um, affected, affected areas. Above you can see the area where we are planning to, to do our compensation. Uh, it's not fully inventoried yet so we don't know exactly how the, the compensation will look but we have uh, a rather well a good idea of how, how we want to do it and, and which measures we want to take to restore uh, areas that aren't of the best quality today and also protect areas that are of very high quality in the compensation area. So we, uh, yes, to get it uh, <laughs> sort of um, um, where we're at, this is Sweden, in the Norway, we're above the uh, whole circle, and you can change the slide. And these are the habitat types that, that we can find in these areas. Mostly uh, old growth coniferous forests, but also vast systems of mires and rucklands. Um, so there's a bit of fall pictures and also winter pictures and, and some, some uh, summer pictures. Um, one of the key conservation uh, attempts that we're trying to do is, is move dead wood, which is why you have dead tree on one of the pictures. Um, so our motivation to uh, achieve no net loss is both um, regulatory, we have to compensate because if in this mining area we have red listed and, and, and protected species that we are, are obliged to compensate for, but also we want to um, compensate for, for the whole effect. So we've chosen to do a bit more than we have to. Uh, we're, we're trying to achieve both species and functionality in habitats to replace the ones that we are essentially destroying. Uh, the status and method we're using is the of standards. Um, as an inspiration, we should say, because we are also trying to um, we have to follow the legislation, of course, and uh, where legislation legislation is comes first, of course. Uh, and the method that we use is habit detectors. So we we use both quantitative and, and area, or quality of area and mass of area to get a measure uh, on how how much we have to compensate. Uh, should I say something else? Cool, man. If you've got something else. No. Oh, that's good. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Stina. Sure.
So I think we started a bit late. So uh, does anyone want to have a hard stop at half past uh, five? We can go on to. Can we go on to five forty-five? You slow beer. Yeah, right. Let's do it. If you could go out and get some beers for about five thirty, then we can <laughs> carry on till about uh, uh, ten o'clock at night. <laughs> now, thanks very much to the panel for some uh, fascinating presentations. We'd like to ask some specific questions around the challenges that many of us face in applying the mitigation hierarchy. Um, I'm going to ask the panel uh, a couple of questions. They'll respond on that theme, and then I'll open it to the floor for one or two questions so that you can ask the panel to clarify if you've not understood the answer to their question. Does it make sense? Great. Okay. So we're going to start with... Does it make sense to you? I should ask <laughs> Great. So, um, one of the first questions we're often tackling is how has the project really addressed the mitigation hierarchy and the goal of, goal of no net loss? We've begun to see the answer to some of these questions in your presentation. Um, we have Sandra and Helen now to uh, answer. Sandra, would you like to go first? So, um, well, Can you hear Sandra if she sits there? Does she need to come forward? You need, either need to stand up, speak loudly, or, or come forward. All the way Try to speak loudly. So, um, in a mitigation banking exercise, generally you don't really talk about avoidance and, and limitation of, of impacts because basically you are at the last step of that. So, what I, I wanted to make clear is first of all that for a mitigation bank, the regulation is very, very important. First of all, because only because there is a regulation you can implement a, a mitigation bank, that's the first thing. And then the second thing is that, obviously, you're not deciding whether or not the project should go on. It has to be the regulatory author authority which decides whether or not the project should go on and whether or not these steps of avoidance and limitation have been taken. Although, what I found very interesting when I read the contract, because what I forgot to say earlier is that so there is a, a specialized company between um, United Waters, or our company, and the client of the mitigation bank. So it's a specialized company in ecology and in mitigation banks, basically, and they are doing the surveys, the, the restoration actions, and selling the credits, etc. However, in the contract that we have with that specific company, we actually can decide to not sell credits. <coughs> not well, of course, it's complicated for someone who has someone, something to sell to say, no, I'm not going to sell this to you. But still, there is an opportunity in this contract for us to say, well, we have a, a corporate responsibility to make sure that the mitigation hierarchy was followed. And if we believe that it hasn't been followed right, we can say, no, we're not going to sell the credits. Great. Thank you, Sandra. <coughs> Hello. Um, how have you applied the mitigation hierarchy? Really, have you applied it? Are you going to apply it? How are you, how are you designing it? We're, we're going to, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> we haven't got to that stage yet. Um, we're planning to uh, identify avoidance, um, residual impacts, and potential offset sites very early on and during the life of mine. Um, so, uh, AMA, the Anglo-Americans uh, Ecological Consultants, have identified the baseline, very comprehensive biodiversity baseline, and uh, Golder Associates have undertaken the hydrology and the hydrogeology assessments of this region, and FFI are looking at both of those bits of data to try and put them together to understand the ecosystem function and process at that, you know, at a landscape level. More, more, uh, more or less, and then, or at least beyond the, the, the mining footprint, anyway. And um, on top of that information, we're going to overlay um, some of the mine designs, that the potential options for mine designs, on top of that, so that we can then go ahead and identify which mine planning or which mine option would provide the biggest avoidance for for for, for, for of that impact. Throughout that process, obviously, we can then go and look at each of those mining options and identify residual impact, potential residual impact of each of the different mining options, and therefore use that information to try and identify what would be an, a, 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 good, um, a good offset site, what would actually meet that residual impact, could it meet the residual impact that's been identified um, going forward. Um, yeah. Great, thanks Helen. Great to hear that the pragmatic GIS-based tools are being used to select 
optimal avoidance for these kinds of uh, impacts. So I'll take a couple of questions from the floor if there's some confusion or, or interest in these points. For the panel, we're not charging you for this enormous stakeholder consultation. Those of you planning <laughs> projects, you have a room full of ecologists, consultants, and uh, NGO workers. So you're, this is your opportunity to get feedback on your uh, project, in fact. We have uh, uh, Stuart with his hand up. Yeah, I'd just be interested in the um, views of the panel in terms of what they've done in terms of looking at the significance of the impact and how that then relates to what activities they put in place in terms of the mitigation IRA. Right, so uh, I have to repeat the question yes, because right. there's no uh, microphone down there. The question is, given the, uh, have you looked at the significance of the impacts of the project and therefore taken into account how to mitigate uh, how to uh, uh, variously apply the mitigation hierarchy according to the significance of the impact. So, for example, there's a general rule that, that uh, very high uh, value biodiversity can only be avoided and not be offset. So, have you used the different stages of the mitigation hierarchy um, um, uh, appropriately for different types of, uh, different types of uh, biodiversity value and, and magnitude of impact? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> For example, when you've looked at, there must be various biodiversity values at your project site. So, you know, there might be common habitat or rare habitat or common habitat. You mentioned a, a, a species that was uh, red listed, Anders. Yeah, I could just say you saw the line I put on the map. Uh, it was pretty close to the delta. And one very big uh, issue was where to locate the rail railway in this landscape because it had to be north of the of the, of the delta and south of the, the airport. It was a very narrow area there. And uh, so it was located upstream the delta with the most primeval forests, but enough far away from the, 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 uh, the, the airport. So it was a kind of, a, a lot of investigation put down on the exact lo localization to minimize the impact. What you're saying is the highest biodiversity values were essentially mapped in a type of constraints map, like yeah. red, amber, green constraints map, and you used that with the engineers to design the alignment of the Yeah, it was program. a cooperation between engineers and ecologists. I think we all know that's coming out as a common theme, that early collaboration between the project planners and the ecologists, the engineers and the ecologists, clearly is the only way to get any of this work uh, uh, done. Uh, another question on the mitigation hierarchy? Peter. Well, it's a question or a comment. I'll try to wrap it up in a, in a way that sounds that makes sense. And more for Sia and, and Helen. On the mining side, especially in, in high Arctic situations, you've got very sensitive habitats that are they're susceptible to, you know, even short-term impacts of uh, a road development. What we often see, you know, uh, from a banking side, is a lot of those impacts happen at the exploration stage, where we as ecologists aren't even engaged, and so it circumvents the mitigation hierarchy. Mm -hmm. um, are your companies, I know Stina, you're here, Helen, you're on the consultant to the company, but are your companies looking at applying the mitigation hierarchy at those very early stages of exploration? Because often, you know, if you drive the road through Muskeg or through Tundra in the north, it takes years and years and years to reclaim, and, and it's difficult to kind of figure out offsets uh, mm -hmm. or even. How do you, well, you miss the mitigation hierarchy, how do you then compensate for it later? So I'm just trying to figure out how do you apply the mitigation hierarchy retroactively sometimes? Or, or are you in a situation where you've been engaged at that, even at that exploration stage? We find that very rare, at least from, from the banking side, when, we're, when we banks are asked to look at a project. Great, so uh, the question in summary might be, how do you apply the mitigation hierarchy for mining exploration? And secondly, where it hasn't been applied, how are you tackling the fact that there are impacts due to mining exploration when you come to the project? It's directed at Helen and Stina, but obviously... Sure, yeah. Um, so actually, the, um, uh, the, uh, the guys from ARMA, the uh, ecological uh, con contractors that Anglo-American have hired, have, um, as I said, undertaken a very comprehensive baseline already to date, and they're doing the exploration. They're exploring at this moment in time. That baseline and all the eco ecological work that they've done has actually helped to inform how they uh, explore in that very sensitive region. So they, for example, uh, changed some of their processes to only uh, drill in uh, wintertime when certain areas of sensitivity are frozen. 
so they can reduce the impact there. Additionally, that, that baseline and, that, and the identification of those sensitive areas has helped to drive the development of a new drilling system that was developed by Anglo-Americans drill um, contractors, CATI, and uh, they've developed this closed loop drilling system which basically reduces the impact of a normal drill, um, drill rig on the environment. So it recycles the water, it stores some of the, the, the uh, earth that's brought up to the surface. So you can actually see demonstrated avoidance of impact at that early stage. So I think it's a very good example of how and why you should undertake you know, these amazing baselines early on at, at that exploration stage and how it should inform um, exploration practices and processes. Great, thank you. Helen. Um, I'll, I'll go as well. Um, yeah, so I think the mitigation here is actually very much embedded already in, in the environmental trial system. So uh, unfortunately, with mines, you have to go where the ore is. <laughs> uh, you, you can't really place a mine in so many places, but where there's ore. So what you can do is, is plan for the surrounding activities to be placed in, in places where you don't, where, or plan them so that you affect as little as possible by, for example, um, uh, not, um, keeping um, deposits as close, uh, waste rock deposits close to the mine so that you don't need to uh, make massive roads uh, in, in untouched nature and so on. But also, um, and, and this is quite interesting, uh, close to our uh, mine project is, I mean, the north of Sweden is, is pretty much full of, of protected areas. Um, Yes, I think here about 24% of, of the um, area are protected already. And one of the areas that are protected are on the other side of the road. I don't know if you remember the picture I showed you. But our, our affected mine, our mine is very, very close to, to an existing road, um, a European road. So it's, it's one of the bigger roads in, in the area. Um, and on the other side of that road, you have a nature 2000 area. Um, so, so it's not only um, natural value that, that dictate how, how you place your surrounding activities. It's also um, protected areas and, 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 and also we've had a lot of discussion with, with indigenous people, Sami villages in the area, on how they want us to place our, our waste rock deposits, for example, to minimize the effect on, on their reindeer herding. So you have to sort of take all those into account when we when we decide how to um, how to uh, design the areas. And also, uh, and I think this is very important, you have to have a good plan for for restoration after you're finished with the um, with, with the mining, um, so that you yeah. So couple of very deep uh, responses there on that application and mitigation hierarchy. I have in front of me a sheet with 11 different questions, and we have currently 45 minutes uh, left. We spent about 10 minutes on the first one. So just a, uh, uh, a flag to you all. We can either go broad or deep. We won't get through all of the uh, questions. Laurie, you had a point? Is it related? I have three small questions for Helen. Oh, gosh. Yes, that's right. Anglo American is doing the exploration. It's not a separate exploration. No, it's Anglo American doing the exploration. Yes. So that's yeah. somewhat unique. So, um, so um, number two is um, is that a regulatory requirement um, to do that work for exploration in the country in which you're working at? It is, yes. It's part of the EIA. Is that's that right, right, Joanna? Uh, yeah. And number three is. Um, I, I, it, it isn't. It's tr actually throughout Anglo there is a 
I've, sorry, I should say that I've worked on our partnership with Anglo-American for about six years now, so I know them quite well. But as they go from exploration through to project, the teams change. Teams change. Yeah. So how do you make sure that yeah. uh, you know, that consistency of understanding yes. and knowledge and throughput? Is well, the, the I, it might be something that I could pass to Joanna to uh, to answer. If that's all right. I, uh, just to, to help with answering that. Yeah, I think, I think in this case it's, it's going to be run by regulatory process to make sure that it will go through into the project phase, but uh, now you're joining that. I think the very main one, but also I know it does have, they do have a strategy and system to handle the menstruation disorder, and that includes the whole, it's quite a mandatory and regulated cover out for that. So in theory it's there, yeah. I make the point here it, because in the regulatory environment, that's driving that, so I wonder if that would look different in, in a different place. Yeah. Especially at their I'd like to move on to the next uh, sets of uh, questions, if, if possible, because uh, we really won't get through the, the rest of them. I see that Pippa has a uh, point. Perhaps we can cover it up over, over dinner. Um, uh, it's not down here immediately, but uh, Anders, you talked about the fact that your project is already delivering biodiversity on the ground and the fact that the impacts, direct impacts were perhaps 40 hectares and the compensation is about 500 hectares. Could you tell us something about how you're monitoring the success of this project uh, into the long term and how, and also how you decided on that ratio of impact area to compensation area? As this was an, a very early project. Can you uh, hear at the back? Yes. Can I stand up? Or is, uh, as this was a very <laughs> early project, uh, I speak better when I stand up. Uh, uh, there was no real guideline on this. So we had, we had several meetings with the DG Environment in Brussels. Uh, and from the questions we got from them, we got sort of a, a figure on how should we measure these, uh, uh, how should we scope the, the, the offsetting. And uh, there was this consulting to the government as well. So finally we ended up with a very large security margin because there were stakeholders, NGOs, really, they really fighted against this project. So it was a very tough debate regionally about this project and also on the national level. And, and uh, one of the, the big, uh, uh, <coughs> main work in this project was to actually find out, to make a good baseline, how is the bean goes affected by the project, by the railway. The bean goes was one of the, the, the target species. So we, together with scientists from the university, monitored bean goes for four years to understand the life cycle of these birds during April month, when they migrated from northern Germany up to way to the boreal forests and the, the tundra. And during this month, during these might maybe 14 days, what do they do and what do they need? So that is sort of a, a, the way we, we design the, the, the offsetting for the birds. Uh, and um, after that, there is a, a, a fund started to, to manage uh, all the, the biodiversity offsetting areas. And that was uh, like two and a half million euros set aside by the railway administration. And that's run for 550 or 100 years. It's a very good context with a, with a board of the stakeholders that were against it, the county administration, the municipalities, the farmers, who is also having grazing cattle in, in the, the area. So it's working very well. And the output from the fund is dry, sort of running the, the, pro, the, the offsetting areas. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Anne. Very interesting example where if you did the technical calculation or followed simply a multiplier system, you might suggest a certain ratio. In fact, here it seems that the stakeholder interest in the project has driven uh, the ratio of compensation uh, upwards. And it's a very important lesson for us all that you might be, be able to technically demonstrate no net loss, but if your stakeholders haven't agreed with you, you're nowhere. Um, we have one point there at the uh, uh, back from Joe uh, Bull. We'll take that. Um, one thing that I'd like to highlight which goes throughout today's uh, session, is the great difference between, uh, to be honest, uh, non-OECD versus OECD uh, uh, projects. We're hearing lots of examples of where no net loss is, uh, the planning at least is succeeding because of a regulatory driver and uh, concerned stakeholders and finance being available. It's a very different situation in, uh, uh, in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, it's of uh, Southeast Asia and South America where many of us are, are working. So, um, uh, it would be interesting to hear from the floor some questions on what the recommendations and lessons are from this panel 
for those working in, uh, in uh, um, projects which are under a voluntary regime but without those same, uh, that same regulatory driver. Joe. Yeah, thanks, John. I just wanted to pick up on Andrew's point, which you made very casually, that there was kind of 50 to 100 year management plan on the Uber River Delta project. I mean, like, doing offset projects, I know that has anything like that length of time for management plan. I think they all should ideally have that kind of you know, 100 year management plan. I think in any other country, in the UK, in France, you know, getting a five or 10 year management plan would be quite achievable. How did that even come about? How is that even possible with the requirements in, in the treatment? I just, I think it's interesting. Yeah, great questions. The question from Joe is how, do you, how has this project managed to develop a 50 to 100 year management plan for the offset site? The reason for this was that there was already a, a, a coastal railway with a very bad standard further inland. And that railway had been there for 100 years. So we thought now when we build a new railway we have to think about 100 years ahead. So if you are in a mining or a quarry project maybe you should look for one generation but this is focusing on three generations and uh, so one, one of the big challenges in the long term is to maintain uh, to maintain uh, how do you say farms with cattle because we need cattle to graze these wetlands so there's a big cooperation between the fund today and the local farmers the local farmers are in the fund the board of the farm uh, in the board, board of the fund Great, thanks, Andrew. Yeah. Still, it's an extraordinary example, an inspiration. Really, we need these examples to show the rest of the world that really we should be asking for these kind of length of management plans because that's the time scale over which biodiversity outcomes accrue. Two more. Um, we had a question, Stuart, so we'll have one from Johnny Miller. Um, hi, so uh, I think it's a question about Andrew's, but also a reference to Valerie and uh, Claire, but quite a few of the developments have impacts on uh, Natura 2000 sites and uh, on the European species. Um, and uh, Valerie talks about intensive conservation measures to kind of layer up mitigation and compensation. And I was wondering whether uh, we had come across any issues around additionality, uh, where measures required for uh, an entry, uh, uh, a European protected species or an entry case site uh, would compensate for other wider biodiversity <coughs> So this is the question, some of the impacts are upon Natura 2000 sites which should have a set of management actions already agreed and how, where's the additionality in terms of have you sorted out, uh, uh, identified the additionality of your extra management, management actions? Yeah. Great. Make sense, Valerie? Uh, or anyone else who has an impact on a Natura 2000 site? If your impact are on a Natura 2000 site, uh, there should already, already be government actions agreed for the site. So are your actions additional to those actions, and how do they benefit biodiversity? Yes, our actions are additional, and this is a very important point, because in France, as you know, there is less and less <coughs> money, uh, national money for environment, and for a lot of other things anyway. <laughs> so the problem is that we can um, um, notice a transfer uh, of um, charges from the state to uh, private projects like ours. This is the first point, and we, I, I could have spoken uh, of another project that we um, built um, in 20, from 28 till 2010. It's an A65 motorway uh, in the southwest of France between uh, uh, Bordeaux and Pau. Uh, 150 kilometers and can you imagine that our offset um, areas reached 1,362 hectares during uh, 70 years 70, not 17, 70 years so it was incredible and, and, and um, it was a, a, a real trauma inside of the company and this is maybe why I'm here today because from this trauma um, was born uh, an awareness of the board and of the CEO to uh, create a real involvement in biodiversity issues, to be a player and not a follower. Uh, but the, the answer is yes, it's additional. Okay. How was it calculated Normally, that the offset was required to be 1,700 hectares for 70 years? It's a very good question because uh, it was a punishment. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's, <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, I, I think it's understandable. Good answer, yeah. <laughs> so once again, we see <laughs> stakeholder concerns no, 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 or issues. It's, it's, they, they just added the offset measures of the three laws. That's the reason why we tried with this other major project of the company um, uh, to, um, to find a method of fungibility uh, to address the three, uh, mm. the three acts, the three laws uh, in, within the same perimeter because it's, it was so, imp so difficult to negotiate with farmers and we, we, we managed uh, with the CDC Biodiversity who spoke uh, <laughs> in the former round table uh, to reach this incredible amount of areas uh, but it was the first and the very last time that we did it. We had no choice because, you know, uh, uh, we had, we didn't get our environmental <laughs> authorizations and we had six months of delay. So we lost a lot of money, a lot of, <coughs> really, I, I, I'm not allowed to say <laughs> the amount of money, but it was very, very difficult and the banks were, um, in particular, the, 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 the major bank who, which uh, financed the project stopped to get uh, the financial support. So it was really, still we didn't manage to cope with that uh, problem of, uh, of offset measures during such a long period. So that's the reason why we created our own method, but the ministry validated the method and uh, the National Council for the Protection of Nature, which is normally a consultative committee, uh, but which has uh, a power, or a significant power, uh, validated the method. Great. The, the name is I, the Positive Complementarities, Method of Positive Complementarities. Great, it's thank you, Bella. So <laughs> one of the, what, what we're trying to get here are some recommendations for companies, governments, practitioners. And here's an interesting example where, uh, like a type of, uh, she called it a punishment, but the requirement to do an offset under three different French laws, that's the Biodiversity Act, the Forestry Act, the Water Act, has led to an offset of 1,700 hectares required for uh, 70 uh, uh, years. And then uh, uh, the company has innovated and tried to, you know, kill three birds with one stone, if you like, with its ne next uh, uh, offset project. So very interesting to see the, these uh, drivers beginning to uh, uh, change the way we undertake offset projects. Um, I'd like to move on to uh, land uh, acquisition. That's been highlighted as an issue on several of these uh, uh, projects. I think uh, uh, Claire and Anne, have you both highlighted land acquisition as an issue in your project. Claire, would you like to say something about how you've tackled land acquisition. And just before we go on, Rowena is, is our rapporteur, and she's diligently uh, uh, making notes, which we have to hand in straight away. So if you've got any particular points or recommendations that you're hearing as a common theme here, do call them out, and, and Rowena can uh, note them down as a report from the session. Take it, uh, take it away, Claire. Um, with the A21 project, it's a scheme that's covered by the Highways Act, which, in the UK, it means that land can be covered by a compulsory purchase order, which means the landowner has to sell it to the highways agency, as long as it's either needed for the engineering works or for essential mitigation. So for us, the key thing was because the designs and the discussions and finding the areas that were best for habitat creation and habitat enhancement, that meant that all of that land was included within the compulsory purchase area boundary. And when the planning permission was obtained, basically there was a public inquiry that looked at the need for the road, the justification, should it be built, but also was the boundary right because obviously there were landowners having their land bought from them, so they were paid, they'd be paid, but having it taken away. So the inquiry was very much scrutinising literally every field. Was it necessary? So for us, it was very much this legislative framework, the pressure that we had to justify and say, this isn't just nice, this is necessary part of the overall mitigation package. 
And for this scheme, I know often habitat creation is in, included within the boundary. In this case, land that's just going to be enhanced was also created. And particularly for that, I know the hope is that actually there can be an agreement with the landowner where the works are done, but they maintain that ownership. But the highways agency has the right to purchase it. So if that agreement can't be reached, it can be guaranteed. So for this, because the boundary was <coughs> set out to include the land needed for ecology as well as for engineering, you can actually have some confidence that it's going to happen. Great. Thank you, Claire. We're going to start doubling up on some questions, or we'll never get through them. So you're also down to comment on the additionality of your project. Are you able to say something about how you've ensured the, the additionality of the mitigation measures? Additionality, I think enhancement is a very difficult one because they are reduced at the moment but there have been a lot of schemes in the UK where farmers and forestry owners can get grants to do enhancement. But certainly all of our works were things that the, we know the landowners weren't planning to do anyway. And certainly the habitat creation, we can be confident that that was genuine additionality, not something that anyone was planning to do anyway. So the woodland, and there's heathland on the scheme as well, so that is something real on the ground. Great. Okay, thank you. Anders, would you like to say something brief on land acquisition? or Can you see Good, yeah. Questions on land acquisition and these uh, problems it poses? Just a question around the the land ownership and the management of it, obviously, with the more offset in, in perpetuity, what level, from a mining company perspective versus a, a government road agency, can you ensure that the, the management of that offset and the actual management of the land is included in, in, in the offset? In other words, whether you're talking about 20 years or we're talking about 100 years in terms of the, the rate, how do you ensure that the management, the actual work that needs to be done is, is carried out? And who's ultimately responsible? So the question is who's responsible and how do we ensure the management actually happens? In this specific case, um, there's a commitment to a 25-year management plan. And one of the reasons behind that, I know something Joe Bull mentioned earlier, is in the UK, 10 years as a maximum is more usual. But that was, the 25 years covers the heathland as well as the woodland but it was really focusing on the woodland, actually coming back to basic ecology, that the woodland that's aimed to be created is coppice woodland. So 25 years, you've got the chance to establish it, get it right, and go through at least one whole coppice rotation within that set 25 year period. So if the land was disposed of later on, um, the expectation is there would be a covenant on it to retain, to, to keep it as woodland. And at least having had the coppice rotation once, the woodland will be there, it will have a value, and that will be retained. If coppicing stopped for some reason later on, then there's a certain time period, at least up to 50 years, where you can do restoration coppice. So, there's 25 years is the period that it will happen. Thereafter, the woodland will remain. And the expectation is that there would then be another 25 year management plan. But this is somewhere where I know there's been a lot of discussion in the UK about this phrase in perpetuity. What is perpetuity? And how can it actually be provided for? But certainly, in the UK context, this has got a good long period where there is a very firm commitment. So just in summary, who owns the land where the coppicing will take place? Um, who will own it will, will own be it. the highways agency. And who, who is responsible for the management plan after the 25 year period? It would be the landowner which could continue to be the highways agency. Thank you. Um, any questions on the land uh, Position. There's a bit of sleepiness coming into the room. I know it's after 5 p.m. 
Do we have that? They may be finishing. We're, we're continuing through. <laughs> John? Yep. Can I say something? Great, go ahead. Um, just about this, this question. That Can you hear Sandra raised? in the back? Um, I think there are the two aspects that I just wanted to mention. Um, one thing is in perpetuity, for at least what regards France, it, it's very difficult for the moment in terms of legal possibilities to say that land is going to have only one use and forever, forever or in perpetuity or whatever you want to say. And often what we see is that the, um, the authorizations is actually, is for public-private partnership often in terms of whether it's a highway or a rail railway or stuff like that. And it's for defined time periods. So the, the offset is the same period as granting the authorization for this, the, the development. And I'm having difficulty hearing you because of the noise in the background. If you'd like to stand up, give a 30 second summary. Okay. And the, the second point is that um, there's some companies, and especially the company that I'm working for, and Yonez Deso in France, we think that it might be an opportunity for some companies to actually provide the service to make sure that this, uh, the offset is actually happening. And of course, we're not an ecologist company, so we will have to work with ecologists to have service done, etc. But we believe as a big company who are used to having long-term contracts and about 30 or even more uh, longer contracts, we have the knowledge of how to make it financially happen, how to make it um, legally happen. And so with good partners, we, we could commit and offer that service, and that might be a business opportunity too. Great. Thanks, Sandra. Would it be difficult hearing everything with uh, the noise uh, yeah. at the back? But we're going to continue a bit. Uh, can you hear us? Can you hear us at the back? <laughs> Would you like to come forward then? John? John? Maybe we, we could uh, explain which benefit for the different companies of this uh, no net loss. Uh, uh, yeah. We've we had a suggestion to discuss the particular benefit for the different companies of a no net loss uh, uh, approach. Do you like to describe your, the benefit yes. for you? <laughs> because, because I'm afraid that uh, some people yeah, think you have to stand up and, and yeah. speak now because it's so difficult to hear. Uh, I, um, I spoke about a punishment, and I'm afraid that you could bad inter badly interpret my words. Uh, as a sustainable director, I, I think that um, key issues on biodiversity are really relevant for our management and for the progress inside of the company. Uh, I see a lot of benefits in the implementation of the no-net loss uh, biodiversity approach. Uh, first of all, the efficiency. Uh, inside of the company because we uh, are working all together all different core uh, businesses of the company are really brought um, excuse me <laughs> uh, are, are really working together um, uh, all these uh, biodiversity issues and and this is for the project I presented, really uh, um, the, the, the most relevant point and a key of success. Uh, then the lower risks, uh, in particular financial risks, because we managed to get our uh, um, environmental authorizations earlier and easier. So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good point for us too. Then the operational breakthrough, even patented, because um, some engineers now uh, are able to create um, operational disposals. Like for instance, for, uh, I can give you an example of a specific bad bridge that created uh, in this, uh, on this motorway in the southwest of France uh, for uh, specific horseshoe bats, very big uh, bats, <laughs> and we patented it. Uh, and then the last uh, Benefit is of course the competitiveness in our core business for all future calls for tenders. So. Thanks, Valerie. So some very clear business drivers, a business case for investing in no net loss for some companies, such as in 
uh, under the jurisdiction of the French uh, government. I'd like to move on to discuss stakeholders, which has been an enthusiastic issue for lots of our panellists. Um, and uh, how, how were stakeholders involved in the process of the design and implementation of the mitigation uh, measures? Uh, we have down uh, Sandra and uh, Christina as possibly um, uh, answering this question. Start, Sandra, would you like to say something on Christina? Uh, well, they've been a major part, of course, because as I said, um, this is, is uh, partly regulatory and, and, and the, the compensation is, is uh, uh, a part of, of our, our permits to, to mine. You so, have to come up here because it's so loud next door. Yeah, so, so um, basically, if we don't have the um, authorities on board, we don't get anywhere because they just uh, won't give us any permits at all. Um, so, so they have, it's like a give and take. They, they can uh, effectively uh, make us do what they want <laughs> because they, they can force our hands. So, so if we don't do it to their standards, um, they will um, just say, go back and, and, and remodel your, your, your proposition. Okay, great, thanks. Let's oh. have some questions on uh, stakeholders. You mentioned the authorities, but what about the uh, the local communities, the, the, the local indigenous people? Of course. Uh, um, unfortunately, I agree. I mean, they are a big part of our of our of our dialogue process. Um, they don't, however, uh, um, biodiversity is not the, the the highest on their list of of concerns. As I said, for example, the Sami people. Um, don't want us to um, affect their their reindeer herding where, where the reindeers eat and and are willing to sacrifice in you know sacrifice uh, biodiversity hotspots for, for, for us to to leave their um, herding areas alone um, so John, may I offer a, a comment then it's, it's, it's similar to the to the point that Laurie made around our differences, or that John reiterated about the difference between OECD and non OECD countries. Regulation is your primary, the regulation is your primary stakeholder very often in, in, in very highly regulated countries. And what we're finding um, is a lot of the countries where we're working, mining countries or early exploration, is that identifying what the tendencies are in the local communities. Understanding their relationship with the land and, and, and the biodiversity and ecosystem services is actually a starting point in a whole stakeholder engagement. And, and that, as the project develops, your, uh, the opportunity for um, offsets actually increases when you start to understand the potential within the livelihood of social management programs that help you to actually um, sort of find a way, a find a pathway that matches the human needs with. with and this is fine. And that's, that's that I'm not seeing coming through in any of these projects. That it's a really, really big difference between you know working in northern Mozambique or in the middle of the Amazon or in you know Costa Rican jungle. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a, it's an interesting point. So could we have a response from Stina or anyone in the panel? Huh? How you've discovered that engaging in the uh, uh, social issues of local communities very early on has that in fact expanded the options in the mitigation hierarchy and for offsets, or not? Um, it, it's um, planned. It's, <laughs> it's definitely planned to do. Uh, obviously, as part of the the project, we need to take into account the. Um, the needs and, and dependencies on, on, on ecosystem services of the local communities, and it, otherwise, I don't think we can achieve no net loss in this in this region. If you're thinking about no net loss as being holistic and take into account dependencies and requirements for ecosystem services, you need to start that as well. And also, more than mining, the mining area. This has been a really crucial point for our for finding um, compensation areas because. Nobody wants to sell their land and use their right to hunt elk <laughs> in the north of Sweden. So, so it's it's been it's 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 actually been uh, uh, quite important for us to say that no, this will not be a natural reserve. This will be where we uh, try to um, 
heighten the, the natural resources in an area, but you can still hunt there, you can still pick berries, so that they know that this area is not, it's not uh, fenced in. They can still use it. Um, and that's been a, a key note for us to even get a hold of that. So, so it's, it's absolutely in there. It's just, it's the, biodiversity is, is just not always the top keynote that, that they are interested in. Great, thanks, uh, Tina. That's a great uh, response. So, actually, the, um, we're also going to have some uh, uh, work recommendations come from you, the floor, the audience. Marina is then making notes. And uh, an objective of this, of this session is to provide recommendations for companies, governments, or practitioners on really how we should be uh, 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 developing projects on the ground. So, I'd like to hear three recommendations from the floor that Marina is going to note down. Given what you've heard today and the rest of uh, um, uh, uh, in this session and the rest of the day. Yeah, this is um, just a reflection on listening to this conversation, the one before it, and then um, thinking back to the discussion on pros and cons of offsets and some of the objections that people were raising around offsets. Um, I think we need to be really, really rigorous and careful around terminology. Even in this discussion here, we've used multiple terms to describe multiple events, which mean different things to different people. And you can see why there's an objection to this um, and to the concept of offsets and no net loss if we can't get our language right. Um, so I guess that, that was the piece I just wanted to forward. And, you know, we, we, we need to really try and lock down terminology and language. And, uh, give, an example, give an example of where you feel the terminology has been well, we've used um, compensation and offsets interchangeably. In this, um, we've used, I guess, discussions around mitigation hierarchy interchangeably. And I guess another point that I would, and this comes from my own background of 20 years at Rio Tinto, um, I think it's really, really important when you're talking, and I know we, we're restricted to time, and, and so I'm not reflecting on the integrity of the programs or anything here, just on the communication. Um, it's very important to make sure that you always link the actions that you're putting in place on the ground to either offset, minimise, or avoid back to the impacts of the project itself. And, uh, and, and that was one of my questions around here. What have you done in terms of looking at the significance of your impacts and how they relate? Um, because you do have the perception that uh, some people do use it as just an easy road into getting the projects done. If you're communicating externally that, you know, this action is to compensate or offset this issue, is to avoid that issue, and that's how we worked out how much we were doing. I think we're really advancing the discussion. If we tend to lose that, we're opening up the criticism. Great, thank you. Great point, Stuart. One about terminology there, Marina, and your other one about really relating the uh, mitigation action to the impact itself. And certainly, Rio Tinto has spent a lot of time investing in, in that kind of quantified uh, accounting. Another recommendation from the floor, Pete. It's something you've already said, John, as it's come out of the discussions here. From having experienced the other end of the spectrum and other projects, I'll repeat it because I think it would be good to have a five-month recommendation. And that, that is the essential nature of getting engineers and biologists together as early on in the process as possible. There's very, very often a disconnect. Uh, either an operational disconnect, or in the case of some projects, you'll have people in the corporate sustainability part of a company who want to make those connections. But the people who are responsible for developing the engineering plan, the operations on the line on the ground, they've got a million other things to worry about. They're not interested, or they don't have the time, or they've not been instructed on the matter of hierarchies and hierarchies. But that disconnect, or the failure to connect that early on in the project, ultimately results in uh, reduced effectiveness of all the things we're talking about. And that ultimately results in increased costs for companies in almost all cases. So there's an economic justification for doing so, in addition to an operational engineering and biodiversity or environmental justification for it. Thanks, Pete. And I know you speak from experience where you see these costs escalate because of that lack of a conversation between the ecologists and the engineers or project planners Absolutely. early on in, in, in projects. Are we able to tell at the back where the live streaming people can hear these questions? 
some of the ones near the front offline. Uh, if anyone at the back, I would say. If anyone wants to make a recommendation, come down here to this microphone. We had two there. Dave, did you have one? Great. Probably not a recommendation, but my reflection is that if your institutionalization of biodiversity strategy and any commitments you make as a result is working, you probably won't even see things like it's working as a period in project design. If you rely on a formal process where an engineer brings project to your biodiversity team and says, come out, tell me what percent of the is here, you know you've lost it. As far as I'm concerned, if you don't train these guys in the project and the technical services side to be aware of those things, Uh, uh, point they're saying build it, di build it deep into company culture, and you'll be uh, your engineers will be doing the avoidance automatically. But then, how do you make sure you're getting, getting the credit for that? There seems to be a couple of responses to that, and then we've got another recommendation. So, yeah, I was just going to say that that actually feeds back into the fact that you can't just look on an individual project basis. That stuff, I think, should be coming into your looking at the environmental impact of the whole company. Rather than just going to the project, you have to have the whole company say, okay, we start by a very high level screening, where can we possibly go? And there are going to be sites that we knock out at that stage before we go into any detail. Yeah, certainly. Many of the leading companies have that risk screening process in place now. Pippa, did you have a related point? I, just in response to Dave's um, point, you know, even with companies like Rio, we know that the, that the, the, the timeline Here from Anders. Yeah, I just want to say that uh, the cooperation between uh, different categories in the project is so essential. And in this project that I was telling you about, uh, the, the, the owner of the compensa compensatory measures was the, the highest project leader of the railway project. So he and I and people from the Swedish A were the ones who went to the DG environment. So he, the boss of the railway project, did really take these questions into the to the big railway project. I think that was a very big success story for, for, the, comp for the offsetting. Yeah, thanks. It was on so the highest level. Both from Valerie and Andrew, we're seeing the senior level ownership buy into the whole uh, approach to mitigation there and loss is fundamental to project success. I think Joe had a recommendation, but these seem to be, are these responses? Are they recommendation. New? And yours, was it a response to that, or they're new? Is it new, Laurie? Okay, no, Joe, do you have, you have your hand up first? Joe had his hand up first. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, you might have to come down. Oh, cool. come down at the end. <laughs> Speak a bit louder. Yeah. How far do I have to come down? Yeah. <laughs> about, about at least as far as the Dave Richards oh, bellow oh, voice. Yeah. Yeah. This, is, this is much more professional than I thought it was going to be. Really? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I was just going to say, um, I think Joe Giesecke mentioned this morning that um, we have no, apart from the US wetland banking, we have no real idea how whether or not it's achieved on the ground or offset it. Um, I agree with that, that's why I've seen practice as well. I think if there are companies or even whole sectors that see offsetting as an opportunity and, and something that can be beneficial, which I think a lot of them can, um, I think companies themselves need to make a kind of a proactive effort to actually centralise information and make it publicly available about the outcomes of offsets so they can demonstrate long term that they can work on the ground. I think without that, the, the doubters are never going to be one round. Great. So a call for centralisation of grey literature on the success or failure of offsets, which has been. Uh, WCMC tried this with Eco iShare 15 years ago. <laughs> we appear to be trying, trying once again with CSDI. Peter. We haven't really discussed it here in this forum or here this morning, but the whole discussion around funding offsets, 
I've been accused of being a pessimist in the past by a few of my colleagues and peers. But to me, if there isn't legislative requirements or firm commitments, um, I think these offsets are aspirational at times. So when we have good times, the Rio Tintos of the world, you know, the Anglo Americans, they're going to fund the offsets. They're, they're multi 50 year programs, 100 year programs. Sure, we'll throw money at it. When there's a downturn in the economy, those are the first things that get cut. And we're seeing that on projects across all sectors. So, your recommendation to fix that? Your recommendation that, is, is we as a, as a community need to come up with a strategy around agreeing on funding mechanisms for offsets. Because right now, it's, it's project by project, it's hit or miss. And, and I think that really is the crux of whether or not these programs, you know, these multi-decade programs will be successful or not. Sure, it's a good point. Protected areas management faces a, has always faced a similar crisis, but uh, uh, offsets won't uh, survive into the long term without long-term financing. And that uh, speaks to the imperpetuity question we had earlier on. Um, Rowena and I need to write up the uh, main outcomes from this, and that apparently loaded up about 10 minutes ago. So I'll take one further recommendation, if, perhaps two further recommendations from the panel, if there is a, oh, Laurie had one, okay. So we'll have three more, Laurie and two from the panel. The take home messages uh, from this. We haven't covered the landscape scale very much. Helen, I was gonna ask you about that, so. I'll tell you about it later. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, have a very, I have a very good, frank recommendation. Make a good baseline, spend time on that, make it proper, then you can choose your right metrics. That's very important. For example, we chose days of being geese. How many days, how many being geese, get a, a normal, a, an area of this diagram. And then you can put a goal for the offsetting scheme. And today, five years after the project, the, the fund is very happy that there are very uh, clear goals relating to, for example, these uh, bean goes days. So that's a recommendation. Right, good baseline, and then you can go up your metric. Here it's bean goose days. Of, uh, <laughs> uh, Laurie. Yeah, just, just because of the regulatory framework, the will from the company to look at offsets at this very early stage and hopefully it will influence how they do their work in other areas of exploration. So I totally agree. Yeah. So of course that if that's happening, then that means that the
a particular uh, client in a particular country context. There's a, there's a stepwise process in the development of all of these projects. We've all seen it in everything we've done. It doesn't make a lot of sense to, 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 to suggest a home run when you're, to use an American analogy, when you're trying to get to first base. Uh, so in a more general way, a concerted effort to try to align recommendations and advice with the realities and the constraints of the particular context that a project in its particular phase, with a vision in the long term, but getting there in a stepwise manner. Great. Thanks for being a call for case-by-case case, uh, take on moment loss. We will have to wrap this up soon, or we'll all have, have our communal knuckles uh, uh, wrapped. Um, uh, Pippa, you, you... I'm horrified for, you know, listening to that, because, you know, if we all take one tiny step, we're going to end up going backwards. I think uh, one, of, one of the recommendations I made in a panel with the World Bank was that, and the Minister of Mind and Energy in Liberia was in, yeah, on the panel, was do due diligence on the companies who you're letting get up into your country to do the exploration. Because, to be quite honest, if they can't do the right thing, they'll let them do it at all. Because, you know, they, they are trouble. I'm not being a sort of alarmist environmental step. But honestly, we have to find responsible actors to take these projects forward. And yes, Anglo is doing exploration and coming in probably the earliest we've seen as an NGO. Um, into, into a project phase. But, um, you know, we have to aim somewhere higher than a uh, kind of step-wise place because we're going to end up losing everything we have to And also, if I might add, I mean, unfortunately, uh, those minds who can't afford to do a proper job, they take down every mind. Um, it's it's not uncommon that if, if you work for a mine you're you're evil, <laughs> um, so I suppose I'm evil. But but the thing is, we, we most mines or, or or the best mine mining companies anyway try to do their best with the with the limited options that we have. I mean we all of us need the ore, and and so so you know uh, we need to build railways and 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 win win the. And, and everybody wants to do and new computer sometimes. So, so we need to do the, the, the mining, but we have to do it in a sustainable way <laughs> of sorts. Thanks, uh, Stina. We're going to wrap up uh, now because we've gone way over time. Stuart's one to speak in. Yeah, there's been a lot of discussion about um, you know ha how to drive this sort of behaviour further down in the exploration cycle. But one of the things that needs to be considered, and, and this is you know how, how do you drive change? And the change needs to be focused at the business drivers for the companies that are doing this. At the moment, 99% of the cases, this environmental work, this biodiversity work, is seen as a cost. Right, it's a cost of doing business. What do you do with costs? You minimise costs, you defer costs. That's why exploration companies don't do any baseline work, because one, they see it as a cost. It's, it's increasing the, um, the marginality of their projects, um, and there's no value in doing it, because they can, can't transfer that cost as an asset to a company that buys the project. So, you know, you know Peter Mackett was hinting this this morning. You need to change the paradigm, you need to change the cost of the drivers to decision making in the private sector and take this out of the cost and into, into the profits and into the opportunity session. Great, that's a great point to close uh, the <laughs> session on uh, the fact that we need to identify these business drivers to uh, essentially, and this is what we were talking about since the 1930s, is internalizing environmental externalities. And the great thing about no net loss is it finally can be used as a way to internalize some of the environmental externalities of the project. I'd like to point out, it's almost six o'clock in the evening, we've looked at a number of case studies we think, well, well, I've heard some of that before, I don't know what I've learned. This conversation would not have happened 10 years ago. 10 years ago, biodiversity within companies was still within external affairs. It was a public relations exercise. We now see it entirely mainstream into the way that risk management is undertaken, whether it's biodiversity, ecosystem services, etc. But we have seen a fundamental paradigm shift in the way that biodiversity is being uh, managed. And compared with, if you reflect on the sessions this morning, questions around is no net loss going to work, are offsets a license to trash, 
I'm hearing a very different discussion here. I see a group of hard-nosed uh, practitioners who many of know, many I know have been in the field for the past uh, 10 to 20 years making these projects work. And we're currently tackling, given that no net loss is now a reality, whether it's coming from governments or banks or companies, how are we making it work? And we've heard, heard some quite extraordinary examples um, from developed countries mainly on how regulation, uh, uh, concern of stakeholders and uh, availability of finance has actually allowed these projects to, uh, from what I can hear, be, be uh, designed and developed to a much uh, higher uh, standard than many that I see in the developing world. So we can, there's evidence that it is actually possible to make this uh, uh, work and uh, um, that uh, no net loss really is a very useful organising framework to bring together, as I said at the beginning, uh, different stakeholders, executives, government, etc., in terms of a, uh, the goal that we're commonly after. So much of, compared with it being a standard that uh, 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 one fails against, no net loss is a very useful organising framework in which to engage uh, internal and external stakeholders. So uh, that's what I've taken away from the session. Uh, Rowena and I will be writing up uh, 300 words and putting it online uh, right now. Thank you very much for being the audience. We have a present. We have a, a question from the back. This is a very quick announcement. They do have to do a quick turnaround on this entire area for dinner. So, I just encourage you all to. Get out. 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 Get out.